All right. Well, uh, if you have your Bibles with you this evening, we're going to start in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Now, this morning's sermon was on Matthew chapter 2, uh, the story of the wise men. And I'm going to sort of continue with that a little bit this evening and talk about what makes someone wise. Because, you know, we had the wise men this morning that came to Jesus and, uh, you know, they went to Jerusalem, then Herod sent them to Bethlehem, and uh, they found Jesus, they worshipped him, they gave him gifts, even though, you know, what they saw was probably not what they were expecting, as they just found a, you know, a toddler, a one or two year old in a house, you know, in a humble village there in Bethlehem. And so it's not really what they expected, but they rejoiced, they followed God's instructions. Uh, the Bible calls them wise, and that makes them wise. So what, how do you become wise? What makes a person wise? Because there are, you know, different thoughts on this. So let's take a look. We're going to start in the New Testament. We're going to be in the Old Testament. There's a lot that the Bible has to say about wise men. We're just going to uh, kind of scratch the surface this evening as we take a look at this study. But in James chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13. The Bible says in James 3, 13, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Excuse me. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So we see here two different kinds of wisdom discussed right here in James chapter 3. There is the wisdom that comes from above, and that's the wisdom that comes from God. And we see that here uh, in verse 17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Means it's it's easy to you know talk to someone to ask about this wisdom, uh, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's the wisdom that comes from above. Then there's the wisdom that we find on this earth, and we find that there as well in verse 14. It says, "But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth." This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Okay, so this is the wisdom of this earth. When you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, and when you lie against the truth, that wisdom is of the world. And that wisdom is earthly, sensual, and devilish. So two types of wisdom there. Uh, you can see sort of this as well if you go to, with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. The Bible reads there in 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we see right there that what is of this world, you know, in James 3, the wisdom of this world, earthly, sensual, and devilish, and then in 1 John chapter 2, basically everything that's in the world is summed up in three things here. It says, love not the, you know, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, we see a lot of you know, what the world calls wisdom and what the world calls wise people. And it is a different thing than what God calls wise people. And you know, wise men, the world looks at wise men as those like, uh, you know, for example, Stephen Hawking, you know, the, the guy that's in the wheelchair you know, and everything that, that talks about all sorts of cosmic things. And you know, people would probably call him wise. You know, Albert Einstein. Right? People would probably call him you know, a wise man. Well, they're educated men, but they're not wise according to the scriptures. Uh, for one thing, because they talk about things that they don't have any idea of. 
And that is something that we'll see here in just a minute. That's not a characteristic of a wise person. That is a characteristic of a foolish person. So, you know, what makes someone wise? It is not the amount of education that you have. And I have learned that, uh, you know, over the course of my life. Some of the wisest people that I have met never, fin never got any farther than high school. You know, I mean, I can think of, you know, my own father. I can think of my grandfather. You know, two very extreme, extremely wise people. You know, what made them wise? Not education, certainly. But what did make them wise was the fact that they feared God. And we're going to see that here in just a little bit. Now, some of the first wise men in the Bible, it's interesting. I, I want to show you this. The first uh, mention, basically, of wise men in the Bible that God calls wise men. And who are they? Let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 36. And we're just going to take a look at some characteristics of people who are wise this morning. Ex Exodus chapter 36. Exodus chapter 36 beginning in verse 1. Because it seems like a lot of times this right here, this description of wise men, the world would never call people like this wise. You know, Exodus chapter 36, verse 1. Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary according to all that the Lord had commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom even every one whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal, and they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that wrought all the works of the sanctuary came, every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work, to make it and too much. And every wise-hearted man among them that wrought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine twine linen and blue and purple scarlet with cherubims of cunning work made he them." So this is an interesting passage. I, I like this passage a lot because this is a church right here that you just don't find in the United States of America today. Because what is going on here is this is the first sanctuary, the tabernacle. You know, and God has put in these men's heart. These are men that are just craftsmen. You know, these are men that work with their hands to create everything that God wants them to create. You know, as far as the curtains, as far as all the ornate workings all of the, uh, you know, the woodwork, everything in the tabernacle, all the stuff that God once made, he puts it in these men's heart to do it. And then what he does is he, you know, Moses uh, tells the people, you know, hey, you know, make your offerings for the church, you know, so that we can build up everything for this church. Now, these wise men do exactly what they need to do for the Lord, and these wise men come up to Moses and say, hey, we've already got too much. You know, we, we, we have too much uh, stuff. People have been bringing in too many things already. We have enough to get this done. And so Moses said, okay, then we can stop doing this. Now, have you ever heard of a church today saying, okay, you know, we've got enough. So we can stop bringing in money for the church now. I mean, what, you know, so he actually restrained the people from bringing, you know, these are people that cared about God. And this is also, you know, uh, men of honest and well reputed said, okay, this is exactly what we need. We don't need any more right now. So this is good. You know, we're going to get this all fixed. You, know, you don't see that today. Today it's all about more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And we can never have enough. You know, this goes from the church leaders, you know, who can never have enough to, you know, the people in the, in, in the pews, you know, who don't give enough. You know, and, and you get the combination of the two. And that's why in a lot of churches today you see a lot of begging for money and things like that. Uh, you know, for, for this project or that project, you know, our God will supply all of our needs. Uh, so, you know, he's, he, he's got that taken care of. But anyways, you know, so here are wise men. Now, look, these are not men probably who have, have gone to school for all kinds of things. Uh, but these are men who are able to, God gave them the ability to do things, and they used those gifts for God's glory. 
you know, they left off their work and they went to work for the sanctuary. You know, this, you know, I spoke of my own father, you know, a wise man who, you know, it, it may have taken him a little bit longer than most people to get through school because when he was in school, he wasn't that wise. So, you know, he was not a wise man there. But, you know, he has the ability to build, like, custom kitchen cabinets for people and things like that. I mean, he's got a wood shop where he does all this stuff, you know, and, and Noah has a little bit of that ability. It, it obviously skipped a generation because I don't have it at all. But, you know, he knows how to get things measured right. He knows how to figure. He knows how to study. He knows how to get things just exactly, you know, exactly right. You know, and that's, there's wisdom in that. And, you know, of course, the Lord has given him that ability. See, the, we, we don't all have, you know, if the world was full of preachers, we would be in, in uh, a world of hurt today. You know, if the world was full of, of people who just, you know, professors, you know, if the world was just full of teachers or the world was just full of, you know, people in universities, professors, things like that, you know, those people who have themselves puffed up, you know, and proud, you know, they become very humble and very meek when their toilet's backed up and they got to call a plumber because they don't know how to fix it. You know, suddenly they, they are not, you know, all that wise. So wisdom, you know, and wise men come from all walks of life. You know, they, they, could, they come from all over. It's not your status in life. You know, wise people are farmers. Wise people are manufacturing workers. Why, there are wise men everywhere in our world. It is not your level of education or anything like that that makes you wise. It is what you do for the Lord, as we are going to see over and over and over again. So let's take a look at uh, the book of Proverbs. Let's go to the book of Proverbs, because if you want to find out about wisdom, Proverbs is probably one of the best places to go. Proverbs written by Solomon, uh, who asked God for wisdom. God gave him wisdom. Uh, the Queen of Sheba came, you know, and tested Solomon. She said, he is the wisest person I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the, uh, he is uh, regarded as the wisest king to ever rule Israel. He wrote the book of Proverbs. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. You can find a lot of, out about wisdom in Proverbs. We won't go to every place because there's just not enough time for that. But I do want to take a look at a few things that Solomon comments on about wise people, wise men, wise women. So Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. Here we have, you know, in just the fifth verse of Proverbs, we have an example of what a wise man is. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5, a wise man will hear. I mean, that's big right there. You know, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain to wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So right here, a wise man we see is one who is willing to hear and learn. That is the mark of a wise man. You know, it's one who's willing to hear and learn. And we see that the mark of a foolish man, because oftentimes wise and foolish are contrasted, is one that uh, there in verse 7 despises wisdom and instruction. Now we're told over and over again in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Yeah, and how do you get wisdom? You know, you have to have knowledge in order to gain wisdom. So, you know, someone like, for example, a brand new Christian, you know, someone who just comes to the Lord, whether they're seven or eight years old, and they have a fear of the Lord, which means they realize that they need the Lord in their heart. They have to accept him as their savior, you know, before they can get to heaven, because he is the only one that can forgive their sins. When they come to that knowledge, that's where they begin to be wise. And they become wiser than, you know, Stephen Hawking or whoever else, you know, who talks about uh, fantastical kind of things, you know, about billions and billions and billions of years ago. You know, there, I, I like to watch, uh, me and Noah have been watching a few uh, uh, animal documentaries, you know, and, and I kind of like the BBC ones. I have them on Netflix. That's why I like them, because if it's not on Netflix, I pretty much don't get it. But, you know, they're on Netflix. It's BBC documentaries, which are... Mostly those wildlife ones are narrated by David Attenborough. You know, this, this wise man. But he talks about, you know, these things forming and these creatures forming millions and millions and millions of years ago. So he is a fool, you know, because he 
he, he does not recognize Jesus Christ. He does not recognize God's hand in creation at all. I still watch the documentaries because I like to see the animals and things like that. But, you know, David Attenborough, when he speaks, I can just recognize right away he is a foolish man. You know, because, again, he, he, he subscribes to the model of evolution, where if you don't understand how something that is the way it is, just tack on a few more million years and you've got the problem solved, which is basically the way, you know, those folks kind of look at things. So we see here in Proverbs chapter 1, of course, that uh, in verse 5, a wise man will hear and increase in learning. Now let's go to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. We're just gonna, I'm just going to kind of go through the Bible here now from Old Testament to New Testament and just hit a few places that talk about how to be wise, what a wise man is. Proverbs chapter 9, beginning in verse 8. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You see, this kind of restates what he said in Proverbs chapter 1, but it adds something here. He says in verse 7, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. He says, Reprove not a scorner, lest uh, he hate thee. And you know, that's, we have a lot of scorners in this world. You know, a lot of people who are just angry, they, they don't want to hear what they've done wrong. You know, but uh, verse 8, Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. See, a wise man will take correction. A wise man will take reproof. He will learn from his mistakes. It's basically what Solomon is saying here. Uh, we see this again in Proverbs chapter 17. If you run to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 10. Interesting verse here, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 10. A reproof entereth more in to a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. That means if you want to, if a wise, if you have a wise man who needs corrected, just reproof, just correction enters into him more than if you're trying to teach a foolish man and you beat him with a hundred stripes. Still not going to get it. If you give him a hundred lashes, you know, the foolish man is still not going to figure it out and get it right because they don't learn, they despise wisdom, that kind of thing. You can't even beat what you're trying to teach into them into a foolish person. But someone who is wise, someone who attains to be wise, they will listen to instruction. They will correct their mistakes based on the wise counsel that they get, as we saw you know, from James and from Proverbs as well, you know, seeking wise counsel. So they will, you know, the wise counsel that they get will help them out and will help them to be a better person. Uh, we're in Proverbs chapter 17. Go down to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Go with me to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, 11. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. See, a wise man can control what he says and how he's talking. You know, a, in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28 says, even a fool, if he just keeps his mouth shut, will be, will seem to be wiser than he actually is. You know, if he's just quiet and hear, you know, and, and we've seen that already, that a wise man hears, listens to instruction, those kinds of things. But a fool, you know, will just, just spout off on whatever, you know, just, just, I mean, and every one of us knows fools. You know, we all know fools who basically know it all. You know, you start talking, well, you know, I know, you know, they, and they just, they start talking, and, and you know they don't know anything, that, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I have relatives like this. You know, I, I have a couple of, of uncles that I just like to get started on things just to hear them talk because they, you know, 
They 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 know it all, and it's it's you know, and and you listen to them, and it's kind of like man, you just you kind of getting yourself into trouble here. You know, experts on everything. You know, and look, a wise man knows they are not an expert on everything, and so that's why they take wise counsel and those kinds of things. But a fool just you know just spews out of his mouth, and uh, you know gets into trouble before he knows what he's doing, and that kind of thing. So wise people are are reserved and they kind of wait. You know. I, I mean, you can even see this in, in the simplest of things, you know, like in, in like a game show or something like that, you know, where they start to ask a question. I mean, you've probably seen this a hundred times. The game show host asks a question, and he gets like maybe just like three or four words out, and then someone hits the buzzer and answers. And it's completely wrong. You know, so they get points off or whatever. And then when he finishes ans- asking the question, it's like a very simple thing to answer. But if you just wait until he's done, you know, you answer the question. So, you know, we, you, I mean, that's a very simple, you know, example, but that's the way a lot of people are. They will go ahead and just, you know, somebody starts to talk, and they'll go ahead and interject their two cents worth into a conversation that was going somewhere completely different. You know, but a wise man, I, I've always thought that a wise man, if, if someone else is speaking, will let them completely finish talking before he answers, before he talks back to them. And, uh, yes, Brother Butch. I've heard that before. Yeah, that's why, because we should listen twice as much as we talk. That's why, you know, he gave us two ears and one mouth. That's, I've, I've actually heard that before. And, uh, I mean, I, I've, I try to do that, especially at work, because at work I'm on the phone, you know, help desk support a lot. And so, you know, a customer will call up, and, you know, people get annoyed if they start talking to you, and then right in the middle of it you try to, you know, interject something. And I've had people go on and on for like five minutes, and I will not say a word until they're finished talking, <laughs> Yeah, and they just go on and on and on. Some people have a very short question. Some people it takes a long time for them to get to it. But you just got to wait until they finish the question, and then it's an easier question than to solve, you know, and easier, easier to answer. So, you know, but foolish people oftentimes, they just kind of jump in there, you know, just, just head first. So uh, let's continue on and take a look at just a few more. We're not going to be real long tonight, but uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 7. Uh, not Ephesians, Ecclesiastes, which is just the next book from Proverbs, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes, also written by uh, Solomon. And, uh, you know, he was, he, in Ecclesiastes, you know, Solomon had a lot of this world's wisdom. Towards the end of his life, though, he sort of got away from the wisdom of God and he got into trouble. And so he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, and really from that point of view, he says, you know, People who are like wise in the world and they collect all this stuff, you know, and they're wise men because a lot of times wise men in this world will become rich and have a lot of, of things and, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, you know, people who, who gather wise thing or things in this world because they're wise with the way they handle money, they're wise with the way they handle different things. He said, are they really wise because they have all this stuff and then they die and then someone that didn't work for it at all, you know, uh, gets it and... You know, they, all their stuff, they're, they're basically working for someone else your whole life. And as we, as we get older, you know, we can see that. You know, I mean, I, I work, you know, hard to make enough money to support my family and everything like that. But in reality, you know, a lot of my money goes to a lot of the work, the labor that I do goes to a lot of other people. You know, the government in form of taxes and, you know, in form of other programs, welfare and things like that. I mean, I, I am... You know, why is it that we work so hard? And sometimes we will see that, you know, in the working world. If you're an hourly person, you know, uh, you get paid hourly. You know, if you work like five hours overtime, you know, okay, well, then your check gets, you know, a a decent, you know, little bump from five hours of overtime in in the course of two weeks. But if you work like 20 hours of overtime, there's not that much difference between the five hours overtime and the 20 hours overtime because the government starts taking a lot more. (laughs) You know, of what you've made. So basically, a lot of that you know time, that extra hours that you've worked, you're working for the government and for others. You know, just to get that little bit more of money. 
And, you know, at what cost then? At the cost of your family and things like that. I've seen a lot of people who just, you know, just workaholics, workaholics, workaholics and lose their family as a result of that kind of thing. So, you know, that's, you, you have that kind of wisdom in the world. And, and Solomon kind of writes about that a little bit in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. But he does speak a lot about wise men, or rather in the entire book of Ecclesiastes. And he does speak about wise men from time to time in Ecclesiastes. But I'm just going to take a look at, at one in chapter 7 here. Chapter 7, verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. So we've got a difference between wise and foolish here. And we actually saw this on Wednesday night when we studied Titus chapter 2. And Paul is talking to Titus. And he says, this is the way the older men should be in the church. The younger men, the older women, and the younger women. And every single one of them, the first thing he said was they need to be sober. Be serious. Everything can't be a joke. You know, nothing wrong with joking and, and around, you know, everything has its place. As the Bible says, there's a time for everything. But to fools, everything's a joke. You know, but to wise men, as we can see right here in verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of a wise man than for a man to hear the song of fools. You know, We have people that everything is a joke to them and you can't take them serious and that kind of thing. But wise men are more serious. You know, They understand that there are responsibilities. They want to teach you something. That's why they want you to be serious and be patient and learn. So, you know, that's, and verse 6, you know, is just a good example of that. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. You know, if you've ever, uh, you know, had a wood fire out in the woods, you know, those thorns crackle and everything, but they just burn right up. I mean, they don't do any good at all. Uh, you know, it is those bigger logs, you know, that produce the heat of the fire and everything. And, and the, the thorns are just noise. And that's what you see here as far as, you know, fools. They're just noise. But wise people are more serious. Wise people hate oppression. They hate, you know, that people are, are uh, you know, oppressed for whatever reason. You know, they don't like to see that. And so, you know, we live in a society full of fools, by the way. You know, and we see it a lot, you know, we see it a lot in schools. You know, there are so many, there's, there's way more foolish people in schools than there are, you know, as far as like teenagers and that kind of thing than there are in adulthood. But there's a lot of fools in adulthood as well. And we can see that in that a lot of people, and I hear this on the news almost every week now, of, you know, some poor child killing themselves because they're getting bullied, you know, or some, somebody, you know, just snapping because of, you know, harassment at work and being bullied and that kind of thing. You know, people just pile on. And there are a lot of fools out there. Wise people do not like to see that oppression. They don't like seeing people get beat up on. They don't like seeing people get picked on. So those are, you know, that's, that is an example of a wise person right there. And we can see it, you know, in our everyday life. I mean, we, we see, you know, people getting picked on, one person getting picked on by about five or six people, and they couldn't even take up for themselves if it was just one-on-one. -on -one. You know, that's, that's just bullying. That, those are foolish people there. You know, wise people hate to see that. So we see that right there. Uh, continue with me on through the Old Testament to Jeremiah. And you can see how there's so much on wisdom in this book. If you want to learn to be wise, the best way to be wise, wise is to study this book and to take it to heart. And we're going to see that as well here in just a few moments. Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercising, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So we see there in verse 23, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. 
We need to, you know, wise men recognize that their wisdom, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. And everything that they have and everything that they've gotten, they've gotten as a result of God. You know, to God be the glory. Great things he hath done. You know, that's what we should be doing as giving God the glory. And, you know, wise people who, tout, who, who think they're wise and they tout their own horn, you know, the Bible says professing themselves to, to be wise, they become fools. So, you know, they, they, they toot their own horns and, you know, they say, oh, look at all the great things, you know, and yes, that's right, I am a, you know, I have a master's degree in this and three PhDs, and so therefore I know all about everything. Uh, you know, these are foolish people because the wise man does not glory in his own wisdom, but he knows where his wisdom comes from. It comes from God. So wise men, in other words, are not show-offs. You know, they don't, uh, you know, like to... Uh, throw their education in your face or show off or anything like that. And we see that here in the book of Jeremiah. Now we're going to take, we're going to uh, wrap this up in the New Testament. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And of course we're going to skip Matthew chapter 2, which has the wise men in it from this morning, but Matthew chapter 7. And this is Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 7. Now this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus actually started speaking in Matthew chapter 5. You know, this is one of his long, long sermons. And, you know, he starts with the Beatitudes, and he has a lot of good doctrine. You know, really, really good doctrine in Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. What we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. You know, Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. You know, he talks about, you know, hypocrisy, those kinds of things. So he continues on. And speaks a lot, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. At the end of his sermon, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So Jesus says, you know, I've been preaching to you. You know, he's been preaching for three chapters. Long time, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, covers a lot of different things. And then he says, if you've heard these sayings of mine, and you do them, you're like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And that means, what that means is, you know, you're a wise man who, who listened to Jesus Christ. I mean, we've seen, you know, you hear it, you hear instruction, you take instruction. You know, certainly every one of us can look at passages in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 and say, you know what, I'm not doing that right. I need, you know, I'm, I'm going to take reproof and correction and fix what I'm doing wrong. All the qualifications of a wise man, if you do that, then when the storms of life come, when the, the rains and the floods beat upon the house that is your life on the rock of Jesus Christ, it's not going to fall. You're not going to have any troubles. You know, but if you're a foolish man, we have a lot of Christians in the United States of America who are foolish men, who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they're not in church, they're not doing anything for God. You know, they, they, they don't know anything about the Bible. When the storms of life come against them, their house is built on sand and just falls flat. You know, their life falls apart. Oh, what was me? I mean, I've said this before. They're, you know, Christians, you know, especially this time of year, we sing songs like we just sung, Joy to the World. You know, and when the, the wise men in Matthew chapter 2 saw Jesus, they rejoiced. Christians should be happy. Because when we leave this earth, you know, which is not too long, yeah, and it, it's coming faster every day, you know. I mean, every day you wake up is a day closer to eternity. You know, and, and a day closer to where you're going to spend eternity. You know, which for me is heaven. Where my body won't break down. Where I'm not going to need glasses to see. You know, there will be no tears. Nothing. I mean, we as Christians should be happy. Why are there so many miserable Christians in the world today? Because there are. I know several of them. 
you know, they're hung up in the cares of this world. You know, and the thorns have come up and have choked them, and, and they don't, you know, they're too worried about things that they're not supposed to be worried about. God says if you have food, if you have food and raiment, you know, you should be content. But, you know, we're worried about a hundred other things. And it's just all these things are waiting on our minds because we've not cast all of our cares upon him for he cares for us. You know, we have not just said, Lord, I'm putting this into your hands. You know, when you, when you walk close to God, you have the peace that passes all understanding. And it reflects in you, you know, and you become a happy person. And, you know, people can tell it. And when people see a happy person, they're like, whoa, hey, <laughs> especially in this day and age, whoa, hey, what, what do you have to be happy about? This guy's president, the economy's in the tank, and this and that and that, you know, and they all, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I've got a car that runs, a house that doesn't leak. I'm very happy. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, the simplest things in life, you know, that God has provided. And so we can see right there, you know, that if you, if you look at these things and do them, and you know, one of those things right there in, in, you know, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. We have a lot of Christians about, you know, I've preached sermons on what this actually means and will again, but we have a lot of Christians that like to point out the faults in other Christians. Don't need to do that. Do you fix your own life? You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, examine yourselves. So, so we, you know, fix what's wrong in your life before you fix what's wrong in someone else's, which is Jesus' whole point there. But, you know, if we look at these things and if we study these things in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and do them, God says you're a wise man. You're a wise man who's built his house upon the rock. To close, let's go to 1 Corinthians because we have some wise men mentioned in 1 Corinthians or some, you know, the difference between wise according to God and wise according to men. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Most of the wise men in this world today would call everyone sitting here tonight foolish. You're fools. What are you doing in church on a Sunday night? It's not doing you any good. God doesn't exist. Yeah, everybody knows that. This is some fairy tale that you made up. This is what the wise men of this world will say tonight. You know, what does God say? 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh... Not many uh, mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. See, what is foolish to the world, that's what God chooses. You know, it, I mean, where, is, where are most Christians today in the United States of America? You know, most Christians, look, the, the Democrats loved right over, uh, over the uh, election cycle. To say, you know, that the Christians today are these poor, uneducated people in rural areas, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, Hillary Clinton said, that's why I can't reach them. Because, you know, they just, uh, it's all about God and guns, you know. And, and, you know, picking on, you know, all the middle area, right, of, of, of the country. That's, that's primarily rural. And, you know, that's, you know, they're, they're foolish people is what the world says. You know, but, and... It says right there, God hath chosen the foolish things of this world. It said, not many wise men after the flesh have been called. You know, you know where uh, if you want to witness to someone and you can almost be guaranteed that they are not Christian, the best place to witness to someone and be guaranteed that the person that you walk up to randomly is not a Christian is a university professor. Almost guaranteed not a Christian because they're wise after this world. There are a few. You know, there are some, but the overall, the vast majority of university professors and scholars and things like that, they're not Christian because they think that's foolish. You know, and, and they are the toughest people oftentimes uh, to reach. Go with me to just the next page, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we'll close with this. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is risen, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world tells you that you need to spend all of your time studying to go to college and to get ahead. All this stuff is foolishness with God. God says the wis that wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Yeah, and the wisdom of this world is foolishness. The wisdom of this world is all about that earthly, sensual devilishness. The wisdom of this world is all about corruption and money. I mean, I, I, I've seen it. You know, the wisdom of this world told me and Tanya in 1998, told us when we went to buy our first house, yeah, and we have our council, you know, which is our real estate agent, and our council, which is the people, you know, from I can't even remember where that was telling us how much we could afford to pay on a house. The wisdom of this world told us in 1998 that our price range should be uh, around $120,000. Now, I, as an uneducated, foolish man in this world, looked at that and looked at what my monthly payment would be over 30 years. I said, absolutely not. There's no way that I can do that. You know, we're going to have to find something a little bit cheaper than that because I'm not making very much money. Right? But the wisdom of this world says, oh, but in five years, you know, basically studies show that your salary will double, something like that. You know, when you're first starting out, it didn't. You know, and the wisdom of this world, when we were going through buying a house, you know, with those arms, those adjustable rate mortgages and things like that, which we did not go with. We went with fixed. We went with something way, way less than what they said we could afford, you know, and yeah, the house had tons of problems, uh, but, you know, I have not been kicked out of it. And a lot of people that were my age when this was going on that listened to the wisdom of this world, I have friends that got kicked out of their house. They had to go to an apartment for a while before they could get back in another house. You know, just like five years ago, six years ago, finally able to afford to get into another house. You know, that's what the wisdom of this world will tell you because the wisdom of this world is all about making, getting ahead, things like that, planning for the rosiest scenarios, and it's foolishness with God. God says, you know, hey, you should be good stewards of what you have. But, I mean, it is a biblical concept. If you read the Bible, don't go beyond your means. You know, the borrower is servant to the lender. Over and over and over again in the Bible, that's what it says. That's the wisdom of God. That's not the wisdom of this world, though, who says, hey, you know, you need to start getting into some debt and getting some credit cards and things like that. You know, because we say, oh, yeah, okay, well, I'm building my credit. You know, I'm going to go buy a big screen TV on this credit card. <laughs> that's, look, that's, that's not wisdom. That's the wisdom of this world. It's foolishness with God. Even just something like that. It's foolishness, you know, with God. If you want to be wise, if you want to be smart about things, in Christianity, as well as just in your everyday walk, this is where you're going to find it. This is where you're going to find all of it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your word, Lord. And it's, Lord, it's a manual sometimes for us on how to be a wise person, how to be a wise steward, how to uh, handle ourselves in our everyday life, Lord. If we just study it and read it, Lord, it has something for us for every walk of life. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to study it. pray that you will help us to understand it. I pray that you'll help us to learn your word. Lord, there's a lot of foolish people out there. I pray that you will help us to desire wisdom, to desire to be more wise. And Lord, we know that the beginning of that is being closer to you and understanding more about you, which comes from your word. Help us, Lord, to desire wisdom above all things. In Jesus' name, amen.